Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Rhonda Asserto. I've been with 451 Research for a number of years uh, with the data centers and critical infrastructure research team. And I'm delighted to say that as of yesterday, I have a new role at our 451 sister company, the Uptime Institute, as VP of Research. And this morning, I wanted to spend about 20, 30 minutes sharing with you some research that the two teams collaborated on. In particular, I'd like to talk about uh, technology and change and disruption. But first, I'd like to start with a little story. So back in the 1990s, IBM was the king of enterprise networking. They were utterly dominant. Uh, it was, they were like uh, Google is to search. It was a multi-billion dollar profit machine for IBM. And as we moved to distributed networking, uh, IBM not only was it utterly dominant, but it intended to use its proprietary technology to dominate for the next generation. And then along came this device. Developed by a couple of engineers at Stanford mucking about with Unix systems that was later licensed to a tiny startup called Cisco. Within a decade, this technology from from Cisco, brought IBM's networking systems to its knees. And uh, within the next decade, IBM uh, signed up as a Cisco reseller. And you know, this is just one example. There are many others where one technology sweeps aside another and the value is transferred to new suppliers and existing investments are obsoleted. And we, as technology forecasters, are always asking, you know, what could do this to the data center? The data center with its generators, its vast banks of switchgear, its cooling towers, its copper trunking, its electrical rooms, and aisles and aisles of servers, what could disrupt all of this? And, you know, as forecasters, it's something, it's part of our business to always be looking at this and asking this question. But for anybody who invests in data centers or operates data centers, it's something you should also be thinking about too. And here's why. Anybody building a data center is making a huge upfront investments. And those investments in equipment and architecture needs to be competitive for the next 10 to 20 years. Consider this TCO model of a three megawatt data center over 15 years. Over the $90 million spent over the 15 years, 45 million of that, or half, is in three upfront installments. That's a huge risk. And it always surprises me, folks building, investing in building data centers, how much attention is paid to things like the cost of capital and how little attention is paid to things like the potential impact of the next generation of Intel processors. Now, the data center industry, we're not alone in this situation. There are other industries that you know, are similar. Um, building semiconductor uh, fab facilities uh, is one. And I, I love this quote from uh, Robert Palmer, former CEO of Digital Equipment. He says, building semiconductors is like playing Russian roulette. You put a gun to your head to pull the trigger, and you find out four years later if you blew your brains out. So this is what got us thinking uh, about four or five years ago. You know, what, what could really disrupt the data center industry? And the first thing we did is we developed a methodology for disruption. And we looked at it as one might an earthquake. If you heard that an earthquake might be coming, you'd want to know three basic things. How big would the impact be? How fast is it going to happen? And how likely is it going to happen at all, and how likely is this impact going to happen? So what we did was we chose 10 technologies, and we applied this basic uh, you know, methodology to each of them. And underneath how big and how likely, we had 12 additional submetrics covering supplier effect, operator effect, and the various elements of the data center sector. How fast was just a, a time frame, a linear time frame? And using this methodology, we asked 27 experts uh, to apply it to actually 13 technologies. 
These were experts from the Uptime Institute, from 451 Research, all the way up the stack, not just for data center researchers. We had security, we had cloud, we had, again, all the way up the stack for uh, researchers at 451. And we also asked a handful of uh, executives at vendors who we knew were looking closely at this. Um, these are folks who have job titles like futurist. Um, and we came up with um, a score, a disruptive score, averaging out the how big, the how fast, and the how likely. Now, this isn't a ranking, um, and this isn't necessarily prescriptive, but uh, it's, think of it more as like an informed view. And we used a scoring system of one to five with five, being the most potentially disruption, disruptive. Uh, prepare for competitive disruptive change now, and one being, you know, the impact is gonna be either remote, unrealistic, um, or minor. And spoiler alert, all of the 10 technologies fell in that three range. But within that three range, you know, because we had uh, so much data, we, we, we averaged it out to two decimal points. And this wasn't dissimilar to when we did this back in 2013. Most of the 10 that we assessed in 2013 fell in that three range, um, but there was a big variance within that. And the number one most disruptive technology um, that we rated in 2013 was all flash arrays. So these are, these are not hybrid flash, these are built from the ground up, solid state um, flash storage. And we, we kind of got it right because last year, um, one of the biggest storage box makers said that at least 50% of the boxes they were shipping for primary storage were all flash arrays. So we did it again uh, last year. And the technologies that we chose, uh, you know, we, we chose them and the criteria was that they had to have either no or low adoption, no adoption or low adoption. So no more than say 10% adoption across the industry. But if they fulfilled evangelist promises, they could have very high adoption. And they could upset the economics, the technical design of existing or new data centers. And they could also upset the supplier ecosystem, um, the supply chain, the roadmap, and their products. Now, there were more technologies that we didn't consider them than we did, and that was just for practical purposes. So these are some of the technologies that we did not, um, we did not rank. And uh, for reasons, various reasons, uh, quantum computing, you know, potentially too far out uh, to be considered uh, disruptive in the sort of next five to 10 years. Um, and things like, you know, nuclear reactors for energy generation, just, just too dangerous. Um, and we also, importantly, didn't consider things like virtualization, multi-core processes, or the cloud, because their adoption is too high, and we're already, as we're already still working through the quite significant disruption from those technologies. So with that, I'd like to run through the 10 technologies that we did consider. But first, we did 13, and three of them just didn't make the top 10. They didn't score high enough. That was post-silicon computing, uh, the notion of an application-optimized data center, where different, different parts of the IT infrastructure are designed um, and, and operated specifically for that application, didn't score high enough to make it. And this other notion of the data center as a machine, so the full facility being treated um, like a piece of equipment, where it's remotely controlled, um, maintenance is scheduled, and um, you know, humans aren't in its lights out, so very relaxed environmental controls. So those three didn't make it, but let's move on to the, uh, to the 10 that did. And I'm gonna go through these in no particular order, but at the end, I will put them in order for you and show how they compare to one another. So first up, a micromodular embedded data centers. These are fully self-contained, small form factor data centers in hardened cabinets that can be used uh, in non-data center environments, such as the basement of a high rise or the roof, um, you know, by a roadside perhaps. Uh, and they can be, you know, indoors, outdoors, and they have a very wide capacity range from say a quarter or a half rack, maybe direct liquid cooled, to, you know, 150 kilowatts, and you can string them together to get a fairly large amount of capacity. 
And you know, the pro for Micromodular Embedded is it's a plug and play installation and very rapid time to market. We're hearing about 12 week delivery times. But they're not necessarily cheaper than an alternative like a low spec server closet. And they're, you know, they do require different operational practices because they're lights out, uh, they're small. Um, so we do think, though, that the next wave of edge computing with IoT is going to drive demand for these types of prefabricated micromodular data centers. And this got a score of 3.75, which is one of the highest scores. Next up is storage class memory. This is one of the holy grails of computing because it combines the persistence of storage with the speed of operational memory. So it's as fast as DRAM, but it's persistent, which is important because if the power goes out, you can still access the data. Now, we heard Jason Waxman at Intel yesterday saying that Intel's just beginning to sample storage class memory this year. Um, and it has, been, uh, it has been in the labs for a number of years. Um, big pros, you know, instant hibernation, instant recovery, faster data access. But the gains in storage arrays is actually marginal, and it's unproven, right? It's not yet generally available. By bringing the data much closer to the processes, um, you know, and having this persistence of storage, it could radically change the, the white space uh, layout, the, the, the IT architectures. And you may not need, for example, uh, two end UPS coverage uh, for non-critical workloads. And this got a rating of 3.64, which again is quite high. And I think that if this was one of those technologies that hadn't been in development for so long, um, I think folks would have more confidence in it and it, might, it, you know, it would be potentially higher. I think this could be really, really impactful, very disruptive, but it's just sort of been waiting, waiting, waiting for it to come to market. Next up is silicon photonics. So this is where fiber optic links, fiber optic links directly integrated with semiconductor chips without the need for discrete electrical optical conversions. So again, Jason Waxman at Intel was talking about this in the context of rack scale architecture yesterday. And we're talking about it in the, and he was talking about it from the network to the core. We're referring to this, to the rack in the white space. And when you have these super fast interconnections between racks, it means you can disaggregate components of the motherboard. So you could have, say, a whole aisle of just you know, memory and a whole aisle of just CPU. Um, and that means that you should have much higher resource utilization. It's uh, cheaper, yet faster than copper, but it only makes financial sense at scale. And this can only be a greenfield deployment, right? Who's gonna rip out copper to put this in? But again, it's not, it's not really that available yet. Even the hyperscales aren't doing this in the white space, but they probably will within the next couple of years, that's the thinking. This got a disruptive score of 3.59, which is kind of in the middle. Next up is data center microgrids. This is where localized energy is generated, either on site or near site of the data center for increased energy security. It's oftentimes tied to a utility, but importantly, it can operate in island mode. It can, if you lose utility power, it's able to operate and generate power on its own. The big pros, if you're using renewable, of course, you know, that's a pro, but really folks are interested in this for the energy security and the energy independence. But the cons to this, one of the drivers working against it, the barriers, is that it's particularly in the US, um, utility costs are, are still fairly low. And you know, building microgrids, operating microgrids, that's a whole other area of expertise that's outside of data centers. Um, it got a score of 3.20, which was actually the lowest score. Um, I think, however, if we had, this could change very quickly, if we had a major extended utility outage, then I think the focus on you know, uh, longer term energy generation on or near site um, would, would shift entirely. 
Software defined power number five. This is where power is a pooled resource, similar to IT with virtualization. And it's matched dynamically according to IT load needs. It includes uh, approaches such as automated power capping, rerouting workloads to where power availability is highest or maybe power costs are lowest or power quality is optimal. It also includes uh, using energy storage for operational um, production workloads when it's not needed for backup. The big pro with software-defined power is that you can have much higher utilization rates of your uh, potential power, your power capacity envelope, much higher. But it's not necessarily that straightforward, particularly if you're going to be shifting loads, because you need to integrate data about the equipment, about the power, the power source, the power quality, and also the IT apps running on that equipment. So it's not necessarily straightforward. Um, and some folks see this as, as more risky, because you're effectively shifting the risk to the software, and it can have a somewhat complex ROI. But we think that if you have software-defined power, we think that one of the drivers that will continue to drive interest in software-defined power is that effectively it means you can have um, you know, lower redundancy in the physical equipment on site, which means lower capex. And it got a score of 3.42, which surprised me a little. I would have thought it would have been higher, but um, clearly our experts um, aren't as bullish. Next up is something we're calling data center management as a service, or DMAS. And this is where monitored data is, real-time monitored data is, tra is transported, encrypted, and transported from the data center to a supplier's cloud, where it's pooled with many other customers' data into big data lakes, and then big data statistical analysis is applied to it, including machine learning and potentially deep learning. And having that vast amount of data, the idea is that you're able to therefore predict and forecast um, events, risks, outcomes with much higher accuracy and maybe even things you wouldn't be able to predict or forecast without that vast amount of data. Big pro is that ideally this would lower your risk because you've got additional scrutiny and it could lead to new best practices. The cons, some folks are jittery about having their monitored data going over a wide area network to a cloud. Um, whether that's founded or not is, is a separate conversation, but for sure there are latency issues involved with that. You can't be relying you know, on a WAN if you want real-time alerting um, on-prem, for example. And I personally am really bullish on DMAS, but I don't think it's going to replace on-prem monitoring and on-prem DSIM. I don't think it's going to be an either or. I think it's going to be an and. I think this will be used to augment on-prem approaches today. And it got a rating of 3.63, which was pretty high. So definitely one to look at if you haven't already today. Next up is distributed resiliency. And this is an area that my colleagues at Uptime Institute uh, spent a lot of time thinking and uh, and talking to folks about. And this is a notion whereby workloads are spread across sites using fast networking, data replication, load balancing, and traffic switching. And effectively, this moves resiliency up to the software level, to the IT level. The big pro is that you could potentially have higher availability of your IT services, and importantly, you can lower your, your capex in the physical redundant equipment. You may not need so many gen sets, for example. But the costs are unclear, particularly around networking. And workloads that like to, not all workloads like to be, to be moved, particularly legacy applications that are tied to big backend databases, for example. So this isn't applicable. This isn't something you could do with legacy apps. It's more for cloud-first, cloud-native apps. It got a score of 3.91. So if you haven't looked at distributed resiliency yet, um, I would strongly suggest, according to our experts, would too, that it's something you investigate and at least have a plan for. Direct liquid cooling. 
So this is where, I'm sure everyone in this room knows, knows this already, but bear with me. This is delivering liquid directly or indirectly to chips, whether it's water or dielectric material, there are different types of liquids. Two main types, cold plates, which is liquid in a heat sink, or there's um, on chips, or there's full immersion. And the big pro is that rather than using air to cool IT, using liquid means you don't need fans, right? And uh, proponents of direct liquid cooling say it's much higher reliability than air cooling. The cons, there are added complexity. Folks aren't used to having servers in vats of liquid and how to maintain that, how to, uh, how to work around that. Um, you know, it's foreign, it's, it's, it's novel to most. Um, and we tend to see DLC in facilities that were built for air cooling. So it's an added cost on top of infrastructure that's already been built. But direct liquid cooling does have higher sustained, can sustain higher processing speeds, much higher processing speeds. And you can get far more IT capacity in, in, a, in a power envelope. And that got a score of 3.33 which is actually lower than I would have expected. And I think, I think it was Mark who was talking about it yesterday. And I agree that the advent of artificial intelligence with their GPU processes, where you know, the, power, the power draw for a GPU chip versus standard uh, CPU is like, it's 2x, right? So I think that as we see more artificial intelligence workloads uh, you know, come, come into play, I think direct liquid cooling is going to enjoy a real renaissance. And I personally would put that score higher. Number nine is chiller-free data centers. Now, the trend, of course, uh, is, has been for a number of years toward lower mechanical refrigeration. Uh, and we're definitely seeing that. But most folks still retain some mechanical um, cooling, at least for backup or trim. And we're, 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 what we're looking at here is just completely getting rid of, rid of chillers, mechanical cooling altogether. Of course, you'll have much lower capex, um, simpler maintenance, uh, more power available to your IT, but it does require higher, excuse me, wider temperature bands. And regardless of what Ashra says, folks still are pretty uncomfortable, pretty nervous about doing that. Uh, I think fear, fears over IT failure rates um, will likely diminish over time um, as more folks do widen their temperature ranges gradually. Um, and I think the increased pressure to be competitive with lower capex and indeed opex, particularly on cooling, is only going to intensify. Um, and I think that's going to drive more people to be looking at chiller-free data centers. And it got a pretty high score. 3.89 was one of the highest scores. Okay, last but certainly not least is open source infrastructure. This includes OCP, Open19, you know, Microsoft has Project Olympus, um, there are other versions uh, around the world. And one way to think about open compute or open source infrastructure is it's the next stage, if you like, of IT commoditization at the facility layer. It means more rack integration of power and again, rela relaxed climactic um, specs. The big promise for open source is it can eliminate costs, both IT and facility capex and opex, in the range of 15 to 30%, sometimes lower, sometimes higher. I mean, that's not a trivial amount. But the big cons for widespread adoption of open source, we all know that the hyperscales do this routinely, but to get beyond that 10% adoption rate across the industry, for more folks to adopt it, there really needs to be a more mature supply chain, even, if, even for the IT boxes themselves. And it's not just sourcing the boxes, because you need to buy them in volume if you're going to get it from an ODM. Um, it's also having adequate enterprise-grade um, support and uh, you know, maintenance best practices around them. And that's not really available today. A lot more work needs to be done in the supply chain for you to get enterprise-grade support and service from um, a white box, um, a, white, a white label IT box. But you know the cost savings are, are significant and we think will drive ongoing interest in open source. And it got a 3.54 score. It's kind of in the middle, not too low, not too high. 
I think open source, you know, it kind of goes up and down in the market where folks feel like, when's the tipping point going to happen? Two years ago, everyone was pretty excited it's going to happen, you know. We're getting much more uh, supply support around it. And then this year, it, it wasn't the case so much. Folks, you know, back to the somewhat, it's, it's never going to happen. So definitely one to watch, though, open source. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how these all panned out. I appreciate this is a bit of eye chart. I will put it in a simpler format. But I wanted to show you um, how the three vectors, the how big, how fast, and how likely, looked for each of these technologies. You can see that distributed resiliency uh, came out you know, far and away as number one in terms of the potential impact it could have, um, as well as um, how fast it could happen. Another way to look at this, Distributed resiliency came out at number one, and chiller-free data centers came out at number two. Micromodular data centers, number three, then storage class memory, DMAS, and then it sort of dropped off a little bit from there. So this is what our experts thought. And you know, as experts, we feel last time that we did this, and all flash storage came out number one. Turns out that you know, within three, four years, the adoption of that has been disruptive. It's certainly more than 10%. Um, and so they say that confidence um, breeds success, but I'm not so sure that the reverse is true. So there's a perennial sort of existential question when you're a forecasting technology, which is, you know, what do the experts really know? You do question yourself. So this time, in addition to our, export, our expert panel, we also asked 600 users in the data center sector to look at the same 10 technologies using the same uh, scoring methodology. And these were folks who were in the data center, involved with data centers, either as VPs, um, the C-suite. We had quite a lot of IT and facilities managers um, score these for us, as well as data center design engineers. And it was quite interesting, the difference in perspective from the experts and the users. So I'm going to run through these in order of how they um, rated um, for, by the experts and show the user scoring alongside. So distributed resiliency, which the experts thought was number one. The users were also pretty bullish on this, and they, in fact, more so in terms of how likely, but maybe not so much in terms of how big. Chiller-free data centers, the users really don't buy that. They don't see that as, a, uh, as something that's plausible, um, as, as a real disruptive threat. Micromodular data centers, again, the experts were far more bullish on micromodular embedded data centers. Storage class memory, users were actually more bullish on that than the experts. And, you know, one way to look at this is there's a lot of pent-up demand for persistent um, storage class memory. DMAS, this was one where they were really pretty closely aligned. Um, and you know, I personally think that the future of data center management will absolutely involve DMAS, and uh, clearly the, uh, the end users see potential in it as well. Silicon photonics, experts much hotter on it than the users. Open source infrastructure, this kind of surprised me. The users were a little bit more bullish on it um, than experts, and perhaps that's because they understand it or are excited about the potential uh, cost savings, but may not necessarily have a full appreciation of the challenges in, uh, around sourcing um, you know, an open source environment. Software-defined power, users weren't as excited about it as experts. And direct liquid cooling, forget about it. Users. <laughs> Right, that always gets a laugh, I know. Data center microgrids, again, slightly surprising that the users think it may happen slightly faster than the experts. So to sum up, the experts were more bullish on some of the, in fact, all of these technologies, chiller-free, DLC, silicon photonics, micromodulars, they're not brand new, they've been around for some time. They just haven't had a, lot, a very high adoption. But the users were more bullish on storage class and open source. And you know, we don't know why that is, of course, but one possible explanation for the difference in these views is that 
as a user, when you're in the trenches, you know, you, you're more realistic about what's going to work. And you're perhaps a little more narrow. Your vision may perhaps be more narrow on what's possible and what could be disruptive for your business. Whereas the experts tend to be, we do fall in love with some of these technologies a little bit because we think about them a lot and we see the potential disruption and change they could have. And also I think the experts tend to look at all types of data centers unlike the users that may just be looking at what it means to them. So just to sum up, I would say capacity planning has been and always will be remains critical. The data center is already being disrupted and for sure data centers will become far more efficient and I would encourage you to assess the top technologies now. Thank you. I think we may have time for, for one question, if there are any questions or comments. Sure. So yesterday there was an announcement with Enlight, for example, um, teaming up with Watson IoT. Uh, Schneider has had an offering since 2016, as has Eaton. So those are the three vendors today that are, you know, com this is commercially available. And for the folks who got, who got a little earlier to the market, they are, you know, seeing a lot of a lot of success with it. Um, People are signing up for it. Part of the reason, part of it is because when you look at AI and machine learning, you know, for, to apply it to a sector, to a data center, the more data you have, um, the more able you are to make uh, accurate predictions or, or new predictions, say. So our, my colleague in who studies artificial intelligence, you know, he always says, you know, whoever has the most data wins when it comes to artificial intelligence. So these DMAS services, particularly earlier on, were really inexpensive because the value of the data was more valuable than, than the cost of the service to the suppliers. And I think that's something that's going to continue for some time. So it's a combination of it's low entry, right? You just need a, either a virtual or a physical gateway on-prem. Um, so low barriers to entry for someone to do it. It's cheap. And, um, you know, the promise of it is really high. Being able to say, shorten, uh, shorten a lead time for an alarm, or you know, extend a lead time for an alarm, maybe getting an eight second heads up rather than a three second heads up can make the difference between an outage or not. So I think um, the, the promise of artificial intelligent analytics, driven analytics for data center operations and capacity planning and design, um, you know, is, is massive. And we're just at the very early stages of it, but folks are definitely signing up for it. I don't know if they're using production data center um, monitoring or, or non-production facilities. It's probably a mix across the board, but um, it's certainly well underway. Thank you, everybody. I would now um, like to ask Kelly LaValle-Hunt to the stage, who is going to be talking about block apps. Kelly?